your table going? It, it's it's kind of slow, honestly. No one stopped by my table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's been lonely. It, it's the same $5 PayPal that's going around the room. <laughs> We're just going back and forth between each other's tables, buying each exactly. other. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone. It's always good to start off with a bit of nonsense. Uh, and hopefully there'll be a lot more of that on this panel. Uh, my name is Rob Clow. I am the moderator of this panel, which I am about to share with you all. Um, by way of some slides. This is Parenting and Art in a Time of Crisis. Uh, and if it's a bit on the nose with regard to timeliness, then, well, sue me. On this panel today um, are um, Kyler Roberts, author of many books such as Sunburning, Chlorine Gardens, Rat Time, and I'm just going to show a couple of typical uh, panels of her work. Uh, this is especially from her earlier work, often featuring her then very young daughter, Zia. Then we have Whit Taylor, and I should say uh, the Ignatz nominated Whit Taylor for best series for Fizzle. You know, I was going to throw that in there. Um, and of late, she's been doing a really excellent series of comics on Instagram um, about she'd been doing about pregnancy and now about motherhood and they are really excellent. Um, we've got Luke Kruger Howard, White River Junction's finest. Um, and his own comics about fatherhood both before and after have been hilarious. Um, and he also did a meditation on uh, parenthood before that with a comic called Our Mother, which is um, a brilliant, nuanced, hilarious, dark view of what we pass on to our children, often in the form of mental illness. And then finally, <clears throat> we have Tyler Cohen. Uh, her, uh, pr is it Primazon or Primazon? Primazon. Primazon Magenta book collects these wonderful, surreal uh, stories about um, these beings and uh, the way that they raise children and uh, have a society together. Uh, and she's also done a number of more autobiographical work, uh, usually with the subtitle of Mama Pants. So I will stop sharing and we will get into the, the meat of the issue. Um, so a big part of this panel is just sort of the ask, how are you all in all of this? in the sense of that you're all artists, you're all parents, you're all dealing with a pandemic. We're living in an increasingly oppressive government that affects each of us in different ways, some more personally than others. Um, and more specifically, um, how what has it been like to try to work as an artist um, during all of this, setting aside your responsibilities as a parent? Are you able to concentrate and work? And um, we can start with anyone who would like to start. Has anybody been working? <laughs> I'm just beginning to kind of get moving a little bit on some stuff other than, you know, like 
giving myself anxiety relief through diary comic kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I, I was pretty frozen the first two months or just, yeah, deer in headlights, numb, anxious, depressed. So I don't, I know I'm not alone in that. I, I found quite a bit of productivity in the early months, I think, of, you know, when it was just specifically COVID and it had just like been lopped off, uh, you know, in the recent months when it has kind of transitioned from not just being about COVID, but, you know, racial justice and all that. I mean, I'll be honest, I haven't even like picked up a pen since like, you know, Brianna Taylor and George Floyd and that kind of stuff. It's like, for me anyway, it's just like zapped it. And I don't know, I kind of want to talk about that at some point in this panel because I don't know if other people are feeling that way. Some people seem to get energy from from that, that injustice and other people it zaps them. I mean, I feel like I've been dealing with it twofold and that like I gave birth like at, in the beginning of the pandemic so like the beginning like the month like March I was just like how is this gonna work like going to the hospital and it, will it be safe and all that so like I didn't really get that much done like art wise um, and then it's also just been dealing with like you know not being very sleep deprived and all the early parenthood stuff um, but also like yeah witnessing like being in a pandemic trying to make that work um, and yeah, witnessing like what's going on in the country and being like pretty terrified. Um, I mean, doing Instagram comics has been a good like release for me. It's something I can do more spontaneously, um, which I think is sometimes what I need. But um, yeah, I'm a little I'm a little fuzzy now for like multiple <laughs> multiple reasons, um, and I know I'm not alone in that either. So I think like I was making work on and off. Um, I made a lot of work in June and then it like totally stopped the last two months. I haven't really been able to do anything. Um, but I think it's like the pandemic like suddenly and dramatically changed the way we think about health, safety, you know, like all the practical things, groceries, you know, whatever, like our whole lifestyle had to totally shift. Um, and then I sort of like dealt with that, but then um, like, thinking about race, thinking about how capitalism feeds into that, seeing what's happened to the economy. Um, and then in the back of my mind, it's like, when is climate change going to come back up as a topic, you know, <laughs> and, and like all this, you know, storms and fires and um, there's just a lot of stuff happening. And so I've gone into these periods of like, I just gotta make sure I have enough toilet paper. You know, like I'm still going back to that, you know? Like, I don't know how to like prepare for the next thing. So I'll just buy more toilet paper. <laughs> um, so I won't have that problem again. Um, and I didn't actually have that problem the first time, but um, I think it's really good to take this time to like let everything fall apart. And like, I think you can't question one uh, like one bad habit or one assumption um without kind of questioning like everything and so i have been looking at myself and the way i think and the way i do things and part of like um just being like a uh i don't know just like riding the wave of consumerism and just like the way things are done the way parenting is done like we've all had to totally figure that out without a guidebook you know it, like of course there's been like a million articles about how to do it you know but i don't believe any of it <laughs> you know um and i like just examining every day like why am i making comics you know um i think it's like i don't know right now um and i have known in the past but i know that i can't make them when i don't know what the purpose is, you know? And I, I think it'll come back, but I think I have to figure out like, like, why am I alive? You know, what are my priorities? And I've gotten like really nostalgic for all the periods of my life where I felt like I knew what I was doing or trying to do, even if I was wrong about it, <laughs> just because it felt better to know. Um, but yeah, I've just been like totally examining my goals. And I also feel like, 
I'm not, I'm not capable of thinking about the future and believing things are going to change. <laughs> That's not really a good thing. And I know like the expression, you know, this too shall pass. Um, today, I finally came up with a new expression that starts to make sense. When I'm in this moment right now, this moment will be a memory tomorrow. Because <laughs> this too shall pass doesn't make sense to me. It won't pass. It's right now forever. Every, the moment is always eternal. <laughs> but tomorrow, this, this eternal moment will be a memory. Um, I guess that helps me put things in perspective. I'm just going crazy. That's the point. Um, I've spent two months like just losing my mind very it's very hard work <laughs> I mean I think that like a lot of us are anxious people like I mean I, I know that for a fact and like I so I have like I have a background in public health and like in my school like we've been learning about pandemic so I've been like predicting this pandemic and trying to prepare for it mentally for a, a while and I was like there's gonna be a pandemic it's just a matter of time like, I actually, I made a comment about it, and I was like, if it's going to happen under Trump, it's going to be a disaster. But, like, I didn't really, it didn't really, I didn't really think it would actually happen, and then it happened, and I realized that there's no amount of preparation, like, mentally that could have prepared for, like, the reality of it. Like, it's, like, even if I thought, in theory, it would be bad, it, it's it's even worse, and, like, I don't know, there there is no way to mentally prepare for that, and all all the things I tried to plan in terms of, oh, like, you know, I didn't realize last summer when I found out I was pregnant that like I would be having a baby in a pandemic like there was just no way to prepare for that and I find myself like still like kind of grieving for the things that I haven't been able to experience like having friends who haven't met him my brother still hasn't met him he's like across the country right now I don't know when I'm gonna see him again um everything just feels like really weird and disconnected and I just feel like I'm on like I'm just like in go mode right now, just trying to like get through the day, you know, just like trying to learn all the, like do the basic early parenting stuff, like make sure he's sleeping and eating and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's, it's hard. Cause like, I feel like normally I would have been like, Oh, I want to make a lot of like, you know, uh, comics about this moment. And I'm just like too drained to do it. And I, I, I'm like beating myself about, up about it, but like, I really can't right now. Cause I'm just trying to get through the day. So. Okay. I kind of feel like with you and I with pretty new babies, like I have a just over one year old and you have a brand spanking new one, but I feel like in some ways we're kind of lucky in that it has this quality of just like you, you just have to get through the day. Like it's just so much about like, diapers and like feeding and then na getting a nap and then another diaper and then a million more diapers and a million more feedings and and yeah. as much as that is stressful and incredibly hard it also it kind of has like a a, a tunnel vision effect um and it's not that i'm not constantly thinking and dreading everything that's going on still but i i also just have to take care of the baby you know um and so yeah. It, they're not it, old enough to that you're having to explain to them what's going on or what yeah. about school and stuff like that so yeah yeah i mean i'm curious how different that is for like tyler and uh kyler because you you have <laughs> yeah. much older kids yeah. my kid turns 15 next week um and yeah i remember the, those early that first year everything was just so in the moment that the whole day seemed to last an eternity um and now I'm thinking more about my, you know, my kids right at that age where they're supposed to be totally going out into the world and, as I like to joke, you know, uh, doing all the things that I thankfully don't find out about until later because they've survived them. Um, you know, just kind of getting up to stuff and defining themselves in the world for themselves outside of the home and with their friends and that can't happen. We also have the double situation just currently where um, can't even get out for walks because the smoke has been so bad from the forest fires. So we're like doubly trapped at home. At least earlier, you know, I was able to kick them out of the house every now and then for a walk. And so they could at least remember there's an outside. Um, so it, it, there's this tension, you know, and it's, I think, I wonder how it's going to, I know that in some ways, 
my kid's really lucky and I'm really lucky with my kid in that they have a really active drawing practice and they already have a really active um, set of relationships through text and um, Tumblr, which I, whatever. Um, uh, so they, they have relationships that are active even without being in person with each other, but that is different than being in person with each other. Um, but I have friends whose teenagers are really suffering with depression right now because this, it, the, this time is so antithetical then to their actual, what their brains are urging them to do, which is take risks and be out there. Um, and it also, it's, you know, this is the age when my kid is really very focused on differentiating from me. Uh, well, from both of us, but particularly from me. Um, and so, you know, being stuck in the apartment together all the time is also a uh, challenge, much though we really <laughs> appreciate each other. Uh, we also both, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, moments of head knocking. I'll just be... <laughs> Well, it's, it's funny, Tyler. I mean, even yeah. when I remember reading your comics, even when she was very young, she was like kind of a head knocker to begin with. So I imagine that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just going to, um, they go by they now. They oh, now. they. Sorry. So, thank you. Sorry. Right. Just uh, getting you up to date. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my, my kid has a really, really strong personality. Um, but that, that'll serve him well. You know, it's just when we go up against each other it's an issue. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's, and, and I also see with the youth that it's, um, these teens that climate change was already a big issue, right? So then we have, then we have the pandemic. And then, you know, my partner and I talk about politics very actively and very, um, so it's, it's not like something that they can, choose ignorance around. And so there's also the um, awareness of the dissolution of democracy and, you know, the rising authoritarianism and, um, you know, the, the absolute disregard for Black lives. And then I can't but not bring up Jewish heritage and all that. So it's, you know, they, they are aware that these are, um, it's hard that I've heard them talk about that there being no future. And then, so then it's my job to like kind of roll it back and try and for myself find hope so I can be holding space for hope so that they can engage with hope because I really do believe, um, I'm a complete pessimist, but I do have hope. At the same time, you know, like I like to quote Baldwin a lot, you know, that you know, there's, while we are still alive, there's still hope, right? Um, because change is always possible and some, it, things can sometimes, you know, change can be really, really destructive while also, well, okay, for example, the forest fires, uh, absolutely destructive, but redwoods need um, fire to be able to, uh, produce, release their seeds. And they need that fire to clear ground for those seeds with it to grow in. So I, I try and hold out hope around that and find, like I said, find it in myself and find ways to express it. And so in that way, parenthood is helpful in that it forces me not to be completely despairing, even when I am frequently despairing. I, I can't let myself stay there permanently because my kids, this is my kids, we're our kid, you know, all the kids' future, it's their world. And I do try and iterate to them that it, they get to be a part of the shaping of it. So that's where I'm at. Carla, what about you and Zia? Oh, we're best friends. <laughs> we take a walk every day and we hold hands and we play dolls. And she stumbled upon these sprinklers that were on in this little park and she was tearing around and she stopped and said, this is the best day of my life. And she was completely serious. 
And I was like, wow, she does not remember what a water park <laughs> or a swimming pool or the lake was. <laughs> but she's totally embraced like what's going on right now. Um, she's like as happy as she's ever been. And it's amazing. She loves to play video games um, and she's had like a ton of screen time. And like, if that's your thing, like now is like a really great time for her. You know, she's gotten to, I mean, she didn't have to go to school. She was done with her schoolwork in like an hour in the spring and then would play Minecraft all day. Um, and she made a friend, she had a Zoom camp, you know, um, this summer and she made a friend in the chat. And it's a girl that's her age, goes to a different school, but lives a mile from here. And they became best friends. She's like the closest friend she's probably ever had. Um, and like, I've become totally immature. It, <laughs> this, this time has been really like I've become a child. And so I spent a lot of time this summer, like forcing myself to be happy for her, but feeling like, why don't I have a new friend? I need a new friend. Why doesn't anybody want to spend hours Zooming with me? You know? <laughs> so um, that's, I spend a lot of time on that. Um, but I've been, you know, and we have lots of fights and stuff. We're not like a perfect, I mean, it's been like a nightmare, um, but it's also been really nice. Um, the thing I want to address this because Whit, you've like made comments and Julia Wirtz lately about like wishing you could do more. And you just said, you know, with this baby and Luke, you were referencing, you know, I don't know how much you're still in that place, but like when Zia was two months old, I started making comics again and I, um, you know, just like her nap time, I was like really obsessive about getting that done but it meant I had to be on the ball and efficient every single moment. So like when, you know, when she was up, I was vacuuming when she was, you know, like if I had 20 minutes free, I baked muffins. If I, you know, like everything was timed out and I was like mad at Scott because he got to read an article on Facebook or, you know, waste, you know, three minutes here and 20 minutes there, whatever, like that didn't exist. I stopped spending time with him. It, every time she was asleep, I was asleep or working. Like my life was so regimented and it was helpful that I was getting work done. That made me feel better partly. Um, but I was like a machine and I was so stressed out, like, and so unhappy and couldn't do like the most normal things, like have a relaxed conversation with my husband, you know, or watch a TV show or whatever, unless I was like nursing and had to sit still or something like that. Um, it was not a good time. And like the work that I made, I mean, I was, brand, I was still like really new in comics. So it was more important because I was kind of developing myself, but you've got, you've been making comics forever. It's not like, doesn't have like the novelty of a brand new marriage or something, you know, like this is your new thing. You absolutely should like, um, like examine like what part of us makes us feel like doing more is better you know i mean it's like we are so addicted to productivity and stuff and what is productivity you know like it is so much better to be able to just like hold a baby and also just like the people in my life who are retired you know or friends that aren't working you know that have like more time i can call them and i don't have to schedule it two weeks ahead of time and i can talk to them and they, that is a huge gift to me to have other people who aren't busy all the time. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that, like, uh, this has been like a particularly difficult week and I'm just like, I need to enjoy this while it's, it is as it is, as he's like as young as he is and like, comics isn't gonna go away. The thing that a lot of people when they're at like life transition, they like, it's almost like you're losing your autonomy and your independence that you're used to. And then you're just like kind of grappling with it for a while. I'm like, how are you, how is this new version of yourself going to be? So it's like, I do like realize sometimes that I'm like way too hard on myself and like, I'm just going to have to adjust and it'll be fine. And that I do need to like slow down. And I, I mean, I guess one good thing about the pandemic is like, aside from just like having to, you know, be largely like, you know, doing um, stuff with the baby is like, I'm also like stuck in my house a lot like yeah due to everything so it's like 
it, it's made me reevaluate other things and being an introvert like there's part of me that just like loves it too because I'm just like this is like what I've always wanted is to like not have to like go out and do, do like you know, things. <laughs> but, um, it, it's different too because like I'm sure for some of you like you have changing arrangements in your family like my husband now is like working from home and his office closed permanently so now he's working in the house and like or in our apartment and out, we weren't really prepared for that space wise so he's working in the nursery and like our baby's still in our room and we're trying to figure out how to like make all of this work and still like give each other space um but like if I think about the good stuff I'm like he gets to like come down during lunch and like hang out with us or like he doesn't have to commute and like we can like go you know walk go for a walk more easily and like you know, I'm enjoying the fact that, like, my, my mom's been helping me and that we can, like, you know, share, like, share food with each other or, like, so we can cut down on our grocery store trips. Like, just things that are, like, kind of communal and nice um, that, like, might not happen otherwise. I don't know. Yeah, it, the uh, first couple months of quarantine, my wife, Abby, was working virtually from home and there was that aspect of like, why can't life always be like this in a way, you know, because I could have him, I'm the sort of like primary caregiver during the day, but you know, she could come out for like quick nurses and stuff. And that made my life easier. That gave her a chance to kind of like escape work stress for a little bit. And it was shockingly hard when she had to go back into the classroom, um, it, you know, a month or so ago, um, not just because of the stress of like, sort of opening the, the household up to risk again, um, not knowing like what comes back in the door every day, but also just not having that, that sort of like family unit readily available, you know, just in the other room if need be, you know. Um, it made me realize how much the, the way we set up work, family life balance is really out of kilter a lot of the times. And it, I feel like there's lessons to be learned from, from this moment. Yeah, for sure. But I think there's also like this pressure um, to constantly being uh, enjoying and making the most of, I, I, don't know, I mean, you're talking about, okay, if I'm not making a bunch of work, then I should be like enjoying this time with a baby. I mean, there's a lot of having a baby is also just really hard, <laughs> you know, um, psychologically. And boring. And it, yeah, and boring, and you feel trapped, and this and that, um, so, I mean, my productivity during that time was, pro was just, like, a desperate escape, also, you know, it was like, I gotta, you know, get away mentally for a while, um, and I don't know, that's a lot of like the pandemic, like this is summer, I didn't work, you know, and just like being home and being in charge of parenting when I don't really have to like actively do it every second, but still like, it's just always there. I just felt like I wasted so much time, not because I wasn't doing anything, but because I was distracted or unhappy or whatever and, or irritated or, paranoid or any number of things and it's just like it doesn't matter what I made or didn't make during that time like my my mind was just a mess you know I mean the, the first I remember the first few months in particular but really that entire first year of being a parent I didn't make anything I did some stuff in my sketchbook and that's it I was just too exhausted all the time I had one of those babies that was up every two hours you know so I didn't sleep for the first year pretty much um, and that's, you know, I'm just, all I'm saying is it's okay. Your art will come to you as it can, when it can. It doesn't, comics has this really existential pressure. And I think, especially for those of us that show on a regular basis or do, you know, expos or whatever, where, um, it's like if you don't, you're not immediately producing something at all times. It's like you cease to exist as an artist, as a cartoonist. And that's, I really believe we got to get away from that because it's about across your life. It's not about, you know, this month, this year, whatever. Um, you know, your relationship has to shift as a parent. It just has to. Um, it, it, it 
all I'm saying is let it be okay. You know, you, your, your, your whole life has just changed and it, it's going to continue to change. And so you, you find new ways to do what you're doing. And also the work you're doing right now is so amazing. So I'm talking to you, Whit, in particular right now, because I know it's super new for you. Um, well, you know, one thing that has been really great is just talking to other cartoonists, like, because so many people have, like, just reached out over the past few months who've been in various stages, like, with um, having kids, and, like, that's, even if, like, you don't think it's a big thing, it's a big thing to reach out. It really makes a difference. It makes you realize that you're not alone in these experiences, because um, even just, like, yeah, being a cartoonist, like, as a lifestyle is different than a lot of my other non-cartoonist friends, so when I talk to cartoonists who have kids, it's, like, we also have specific things that we're thinking about um and it's nice to be able to just like even briefly like connect over like instagram like over something um it's really helpful i really so. felt like i found a niche community within comics when i had a kid or it started when we were expecting a kid honestly i started to have other cartoonist parents um or like new parents or even people who had had kids for a long time reaching out asking if i needed advice or just offering like, you know, support or, you know, if you need anything, reach out to me, that kind of stuff. And there were a number of cartoonists that I ended up bonding with or like developing sort of internet friendships over the, the whole like parenting plus cartoonist, you know, Venn diagram. And I feel like in some ways it's kind of neat. I've, I've kind of joined this sort of subreddit um, within cartooning, which is like, being a cartoonist parent. Um, and I really like that subreddit um, it, more than I liked Jets comics as a whole. Um, there's something about the cartoonist parents that I really vibe with. Um, there's a lot of cartoonists that have had ringworm autobio <laughs> cartoonists. <laughs> Liana Fink. <laughs> That, that, that's the subreddit of all subreddit. Right there. Yeah, yeah. Not not all of us can you know can be that lucky. <laughs> yeah, I mean it really bonds you in a way that like having kids doesn't touch. But hopefully we'll catch it from our kids at some point. <laughs> you probably will. <laughs> um, touching on something that Tyler said that was interesting was sort of this the existential. Uh, anxiety of being a cartoonist and an artist just in general the sort of sense of like um, if I'm not working who am I and I was just kind of wondering how much you know parenting especially being a new parent kind of takes a wrecking ball to that part of your identity and I know a lot of people you know Kyler touched on this and then, you know, Wit is doing a lot of comics, you know, through everything. Um, how much of that early desperate, like, desire to work is sort of, you know, a link to an old life that you're, an old identity that you're afraid is, is now mm. destroyed. Um, but then on top of that, I'm curious about the pandemic and, um, the political, the political climate and racism rearing its head in such a like raw and ugly and direct brutal way. How much of that is also a wrecking ball to this idea of I'm an artist. Kyler said, why am I an artist right now? And I wonder if this kind of threat to like, <clears throat> your basic every way, everyday needs, um, this like layer on layer of anxiety, how, how much of that is a threat to being an artist and how do you find your ways through to sort of um, justify to yourself that what, what I'm doing is valuable, at least, you know, at least to a few people. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's like how well this answers your question, but like I was, I've been thinking about, you know, the past few months with um, the George Floyd situation and all the killings and the um, protesting. It's like, 
I mean, you know my comics, like I've always written about race and identity and, and all of that because it's sort of like what I think about a lot. But like, it was weird, like back in June when I felt like things were at this like kind of coming to a head because I got this like influx of followers and people like messaging me and like discovering my work all of a sudden because I was like a black artist and like I got requests to like make different like pieces of work and I was just like I just had a baby and I'm tired and I'm like trying to process all this it's like this is traumatizing to me too like I actually like talked to my therapist about that a few days ago and I started crying but I just hadn't been allowing myself to like fully feel like how upset I am about like just seeing just this blatant disregard and hate like for human life and hatred of black people like on a continual basis and also you know just thinking about what that means for having a, a, a son you know um who's like I mean who's multiracial but who's gonna have to like deal deal with this on some on some level um I don't know it's it's a lot to think about but I felt like I was getting a lot of like like I don't know, people reaching out. And I think it was all really well intentioned and people just wanting to learn learn more and, and discovering, you know, different artists. But it hit at a time where I was just like wanting to withdraw and not, and like I really needed to like be with m myself over it. Um, and that was tricky. But so. you, you're dealing with like the confluence there of the existential with the, poly with the moment, right? Like, yeah. that they're crashing into each other that you know demanding that you could be producing work about this moment right now as opposed to maybe when you're actually in a place where you can have had time to go you know to be in your feelings and to process and have reflection yeah. and that takes time yeah and it wasn't unique to me i mean i talked to plenty of black uh peers cartoonists who were feeling the same thing they were getting all these requests and people wanting things from them they're like i just need to sit with my feelings right now and i don't need to produce and that's okay it's like like you don't always need to be producing um yeah. you know so and artists need to gestate i mean they they do it just i yeah. I, I well i don't know there's some artists out there some cartoonists who seem to have that ability to just respond really immediately to things and put out some really smart uh visually engaging work and i've always been a, envious of them and I'm someone who I'm a, I'm a slow processor and I need to let stuff sit in me for a while and it'll it'll come when it's able to come and uh, so I feel yeah. like for me there was this kind of double whammy that happened parenthood itself kind of it sort of twists your uh, your your view on comics just by the nature of that you have this thing that you need to take care of and raise and it also kind of shifts your priorities you know completely around sometimes at least it did for me where it felt like I was examining the reasons why I was doing comics in relation to this new thing which was just like wholly different from anything I had experienced you know a kind of falling in love I hadn't experienced before um, and that was challenging the way I felt about creating work on its own. But then you had this other like awful layer of the shit sandwich that was, you know, challenging the work by way of saying like, hey, the world might never be like it, it was before, um, you know, and comics might never work like it is like it did, you know, a couple months ago, like distribution is falling apart, like publishing isn't maybe gonna be the way it, it used to be, or or even things like conventions and that kind of stuff. And that added another layer of like kind of dread or uncertainty about like the reasons or motivations to keep doing the work. Because if the world falls apart to to a bad enough degree, eventually, I'm going to stop making comics like I'm not going to make comics if I'm in the middle of like, you know, World War Two Germany necessarily, you know, like in the thick of it. And if like things got bad enough, I would abandon at least me personally, I would abandon comics for my family like that, you know, and the scary thing is I don't know how close or not we are to that kind of point historically where it's like it doesn't make sense to make comics right now. And so there's there's been a kind of like, for me anyway, like pausing and sitting back on my heels a little bit and being like, 
I almost kind of want to wait to see how this plays out before I put too much emotional energy into the work. I don't know if any of y'all are feeling that at all. Yeah, but you got me reflecting on, um, I mean, I've certainly had that same feeling of what's it, what, especially since I'm no longer in a phase of my work where I'm reflecting on parenting per se. As a matter of fact, I, my kids reach an age where I kind of want to give, you know, I don't want to be telling their story that that's for them to define some turning more, reflecting more in myself. And then I'm like, who cares? Right? I mean, really, like, what, how does this even matter in this time? But hearing you talking about that, Luke, I was thinking about how meaningful it's been to go back and read work by people like, okay, I, I don't remember what it's called, but there's this fantastic bunch of um, comics that were made by a cartoonist in a concentration camp. Um, he died, he was, he was, you know, put to death, but we have these do this document now that, that is, that um, is it, it's all, you know, really dark humor, but how um, we look at art from different times and in different places as a way to, to see how artists bear witness to that time. And I think that that is, significant in terms of, you know, in terms of people reflecting historically, but also a friend, um, someone who I've become friends with who initially was a fan of my work um, was reflecting to me that I, that they, it was very helpful for them to have either work that helped them to not feel alone right now or gave them escapism right now. Um, but both of those things were really meaningful to them. Uh, so I think that that even though, because we are such emotional, be I, I feel like artists are often very feely people, right? We, it, we can kind of, we feel, we're feeling this moment and we're like, well, why, why is something I make, why would that even matter in the midst of these deeply significant times? But um, I want to see your work. You know, and I, I think that there are other people who do. I think it's significant to people outside of ourselves in ways that we can't perceive because we we are feeling insignificant in this time because this time is so much bigger than ourselves. Yeah, and hearing you say that does, it does make me want to immediately go to the drawing table and, and just like see what comes out. And I think maybe I mean, I'm, I'm processing this like in the moment, but I think what I'm kind of struggling with is that maybe I, there needs to be a period here, at least for me, where I'm, I'm separating the work a little bit more from, from career cartoonist Luke and like artist, like emotional exploration Luke, you know? Maybe it's okay to take this time to give myself the permission to do comics more as a form of self-exploration and less as a form of, you know, uh, brand or like presenting, you know, something out into the world or pursuing like a publishing deal or something like that. Maybe that stuff comes back later. Yeah, I think that definitely has value. I mean, value, I think like, I'm really liking just like light entertainment right now. Like I like reading comics that make me laugh, like silly, like irreverent things. Even like the type of TV I'm watching right now is pretty trashy because like I don't have the like the bandwidth to really like, like, you know, consume anything that's super serious. Um, but I, I don't know, I think there's value in like all sorts of comics right now. And I don't think it has to be any one thing. Um, and I think that it, it's an opportunity to, to try something new if that's what you wanna do. Like even with making Instagram comics, like mine are like really kind of like impromptu and, and sloppy. And I'm like, at first I was like, well, should I make them nicer in case I wanna do something to them? And I'm like, no, cause it feels like nice just to like do it when I have the time to do it, you know? And like then to have some interactions with people online and I'll worry about the more serious stuff like later, you know. Um, but like just to shift gears a little bit, like I've been doing like 
not like tons, but a little bit of editing for the nib on the pandemic issue that they're working on. And like that gives me hope, like just seeing like people, like people from all over the world who are like all dealing with like shit right now, like in all variety of different ways, you know, um, and how it's like impacted everybody um, and like trying to find like both the humor in situations and also like there's some really dark, awful stuff going on right now. But I think there's a place for like nonfiction comics right now, like if you want to do that, and there's a place for like writing gag comics because those are equally make people's quality of life better. <laughs> like, you know, I don't know. It's like all the animal videos on, you know, YouTube are probably an unprecedented yeah. like viewing, you know. Um, yes. I, I just think like there, there's like a million good reasons to make art, but I don't think anybody like actually makes art for good reasons. I think we have like our own irrelevant reasons for doing all the most important things in our life. Like the partner that you choose to live with or choosing to live alone, um, having kids or choosing not to have kids, the number of kids, like having a dog or a cat. Like, these are huge life changing. They shape everything, your, your job. Um, and I just don't, I don't think anybody does it for like a, like nobody makes a pro and con list and then like really scientifically like reasons out what's gonna have the best outcome for them. Like almost everything that we do that we feel like the strongest about is basically some kind of impulse, you know, and maybe it comes from our um, will to survive or our will to procreate or, you know, I don't know like how much of it is biological and how much of it is cultural. Um, you know, like, why do you believe the things that you believe? Well, for most people, it's because like all their mentors or their family or friends, you know, like, and the newspapers they read, like, it's because everything they're exposed to is that, you know? Um, and like, w we probably all, I mean, it's more common maybe for artists to like make a break with some kind of thought pattern that you were raised with. Um, but even once you make a break and have a new thought pattern, new belief system, it still like becomes a habit, you know? Um, and this is like the pandemic. It's all about like science versus not science in it's this war, you know? Um, but then even the people who are like on the side of science, you find out, Oh, but they also like really care about astrology <laughs> and they also like don't want to get vaccines. Wait, what? You know, you're, you're on the science side. Um, I mean, it's just like this along with the pandemic and racism and everything else is also like cancel culture, which does like a lot of good in terms of it has done some good, the Me Too movement and all this stuff. Um, like holding people accountable for terrible acts you know but it also like has complicated everything like it's the culture of criticism and judgment and black and white thinking and just like needing to be right all the time that's like is on for coming from every side you know um and like this denial that like the goal is for us all to keep living here, <laughs> you know? And even if we believe like, okay, my goal is just not to hurt anybody, <laughs> you know, like as an artist, as a person, I'm just going to try not to cause harm. Um, the more you think about that, the more you can't do it. You know, like what you, what I do in my head is think like, We just um, lost you. Oh, oh shoot. Okay, you're back. You're back. I, I'm we done. lost you. We I'm lost on a tangent. You. I'm, I'm I... on another track. <laughs> Rambling. Am I back yet or not? Yeah, you're back. back. All right. I'm done, seriously. <laughs> the dangers of a Zoom panel, although we actually made it all the way to the end before something glitched out so uh, i'm i'm happy about that speaking of which we're just about out of time um do you all have like sort of a final thought on anything that we've sort of discussed tonight it seems that like 
things are grim, but uh, there are reasons for hope if we look for them. Seems to be one theme here, and that <laughs> I'm, kinda, I, I'm 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 digging it out. I'm trying to, trying to dig out something here. Um, but also just like we just kind of the reality of being a parent is that you don't have the luxury of not being able to keep going. And that, however, and the reality of living in the world we are that has so many crisis points, there's a sense in which, you know, most artists, many artists, you know, are anxious. Um, and all of us grapple with mental illness in one way or another. And uh, anxiety is a thing that often has us reacting to things that aren't there. Um, but the reality is that in our world, there is terrible stuff happening all the time every day and it's real. And it's sort of like, if it's almost like the rest of the world is kind of catching up to that feeling that people with a lot of anxiety feel felt all the time anyway. Um, and as parents, it just seems that, you know, you can have these feelings, you have to acknowledge them and then go change that diaper, go make dinner for your kid. Um, and try to hang on to at the, at the root of being an artist isn't necessarily to make something important or create an identity. Uh, at root, creating art should be an act of pleasure. That drawing is something that makes you happy. Making a mark is something that is pleasurable and that can be very hard to remember. And I hope that all of you are able to like, you know, keep that feeling so that whenever I see any kind of art from any of you anywhere, it brings me great pleasure, even if it's not something that you would normally, I would normally expect from you. I will say for myself that, um, well, so Kyler said something, she said that it's been a nightmare and also kind of nice. And I feel like that's a very good description of where I, where I'm at with both parenting and my comics. Uh, I fucking love my son so much. Like I, he brings me just like so much joy and he challenges me and all that kind of stuff. Like everything you've ever heard about like what parenting is both like good and bad. Like it's like absolutely true. And I feel like I've kind of crossed some kind of like threshold into like knowing that it's like a thing you can't know until you know it. Um, and, and I'm, I'm trying to just like be present with that and like accept like how small my world currently is. Like my world is really just me and my son and then, you know, mom, when she comes home for the most part, and especially during all of this. And I'm, I'm kind of feeling like I'm, I'm shifting what I want to do with my comics in the same way in that I, I kind of want my comics to sort of reflect that, that feeling a little bit where they are smaller and they're kind of grasping for something a little more intimate with, with the, you know, the community of readers that might read it and not necessarily sh shooting for the stars all the time, but like um, just trying to nurture um, the, the like comic artist to reader relationship and have something really like intimate and personal. So I feel like I've been, I've been feeling drawn towards things like doing comics that I might send to people like a few people in the mail or something like that. And, a little drawn away from the idea of like some like grandiose, you know, web comic or something that's gonna like connect me with like as wide a readership as possible. Like I, I'm feeling a lot more like, I wanna be like John Porcelino right now, you know, or something like that. Like I, I wanna have this like relationship with my readers through the mail or something like that. Like for whatever reason, that form of comics making is really appealing in this moment in tandem with the parenting stuff that's going on. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally understand like what Luke is saying. Like, I feel like there, I was worrying so much in the beginning about all the hard stuff that, but I couldn't imagine all the, the like great things that would come along with having a kid. And um, it's just like, so I just love spending time with him and seeing how he's just changing so much in this personality coming out and all the little quirks. It's like, it's really, it's really great. And it's like, in a sense, like, one good thing throughout all the pandemic and craziness is it's forced me to like drop some of my own BS and my own self-sabotaging behaviors and things that I usually do that don't really serve me well. So I'm like, I don't have time for that. Like, I just, I have to do the things I need to do. And I think that that like also has a good effect, hopefully for my comics, especially my autobio comics, because it's making me even be more honest with my readers about my own failures and my own like less than ideal personality traits instead of trying to like portray a, a better version of myself. And I think that's like the, the autobio that I'm drawn to are like realer representations of people. So I think it's it's like pushing me, I think in a good direction, hopefully. Um, and I'm just trying to, yeah, like cling to the good things, I guess right now, like even though I get, tend to skew pessimistic as well, it's like, I can't, I, I can't allow myself to fall into that too much because I gotta also keep it, keep going for him, so yeah. And he, he's he's really beautiful. Really cute. <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> All right. Well, I'm afraid that is the end of our time. Although we, I could, I think we could certainly keep going for the next day or so on this. Uh, thank you all so much for being here and for this wonderful conversation. And uh, hopefully, in a year. Uh, or sooner, we'll actually be able to be in the same space again. Uh, and thank you for uh, everyone who is uh, watching now on YouTube, kicking off SPX's programming. Um, please be sure to visit everyone's links below. Uh, uh, I have, we have links to storefronts, individual storefronts, as well as um, we're using bookshop.org for those who have published books as an alternative to other uh, book selling sites. Um, they're an ethical site that's actually a conglomeration of smaller bookstores working together. Um, and with that, thank you very much to everyone.